committee. Um, we have apologies from councillors Stewart, Bond and Kett. Somebody would like to move that they're accepted. Councillors Plunger and Reverend Cook. Put that all in favour. Aye. Aye. Against, carried. One slight change in the uh, agenda. Um, normally, um, item 7, the Youth Council report, is dealt with at the beginning, uh, but it's slipped down, so we're going to bring it back up to the top. Uh, so, with that, uh, Levi and Ryan, if you'd like to come up and, and take a seat, welcome along to the meeting. This is your inaugural report of this Youth Council to uh, this committee. Welcome along. Thank you for yeah. taking the time to join us this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Councillor Ludlow. Um, on behalf of the Youth Council, I'd just uh, like to say uh, thank you, to Council, for having us here today. And um, yeah, uh, my name is Ryan, for those who have uh, who've not uh, seen me here before. And uh, this is Levi. Hi. Um, so I take our report as a read. Um, we're just going to jump straight into some of the feedback we have uh, around voting. Um, as we are aware that in August, I believe, that uh, the council has to make a decision regarding um, the voting structure for uh, the next local elections. Um, and the two topics of discussion are uh, STV voting uh, versus first past post, as well as potentially lowering um, the voting age to 16 uh, for local elections, both which um, the Youth Council has some interest in discussing. Um, uh, to begin off, I would just like to uh, say for this year, uh, we've got our four chairpersons, uh, our, our Hannah and Lydia, uh, the two chairpersons. We've got two deputies, Katie and Tiffany. However, neither of them were able to make it today. Um, so uh, now, STV. Um, Levi, if you just want to add something. Um, did you want to oh. <laughs> On the STV or? Uh, yeah, STV. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, the Youth Council uh, widely agrees that uh, we should switch to a single transferable vote system. Um, and we all know what that is. Or should I give like a brief explanation? No, um, you don't need to. If councillors don't know by now, they're going to find out that it's yeah, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't come Monday. Yeah. yeah, so uh, general consensus was that we're support uh, transfer to STV voting and the reason being is that typically it seems like it will um, provide a more effective representation uh, all around just g given uh, the nature of council elections um, specifically there's been some discussion um, and I personally think uh, it could maybe be more effective to have it for the STV for uh, the position of mayor rather than just, just all councillors. But I mean, if you wanted to keep consistency, you could do both. Um, but we just thought it would help provide um, better representation uh, as a whole. Um, typically, um, those who want STV voting, um, you know, they, they're not getting the representation they quite want with first past post, but those who don't really have much of an opinion on the matter or prefer to uh, vote first past the post, um, don't really mind. I think it doesn't affect them a lot, if you understand what, um, the, yeah, my, the, your perspective on that. The, uh, the benefit there is with STV, you can vote for as many or as few candidates as you'd like. Um, and you can use this as a first past the post system, if you so please, um, for like however many people um, and your order of preference. Um, what's good about it is uh, the diversity it can bring. Um, when we have STV, everyone can rank their preferences and no matter what, you're sort of guaranteed to have somebody that you like um, elected um, based on how it goes. Yeah. What's the, what, what proportion of the Youth Council supported STV? Well, let me ask it, an easier question. Was there anyone at Youth Council who supported FPP? Uh, no. We ran a poll. Um, not everyone has answered, but we did see that all of them who voted voted for STV. Yes. It's pretty unanimous. It's very sensitive. Yeah. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so are there any questions on that specifically right, uh, relating to questions around TV? I mean, we, and then we'll we move go on around to for consultation on this lowering the voting shortly. age. But, all right. When I'm talking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Tom. Uh, my, my question was you used the, the word better representation. I think, well, you did use the word better. I think it was better representation would come from STV. And I wonder if you define better for me a little bit. Uh, I would define better as more people um, in Invercargill satisfied with who um, holds position in council. Uh, so uh, it would be hard to quantify um, in terms of, like, you know, just asking people, I, I, I suppose, uh, if, if they are more satisfied uh, with the outcome of the election rather than mm. not. Uh, yeah. Okay. Does that I, answer I, your question? I just wonder whether, you know, better sort of implies the representation would be better. I think maybe what you're meaning is fairer, would that be? Yes, yes. I think it would be better in the sense that the people of Invercargill would be more satisfied uh, with the election system. Um, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Crackett. Thank you, Councillor Ludlow. Um, just expanding on that with um, what Councillor Campbell has said. <laughs> Do you think, that with, when you say more satisfied through the STV system, it's likely that we would see more, um, and perhaps when you're saying better, is it more an accurate representation or reflection of our diverse communities and ranges of people? Yes, that it would be a more accurate representation of who the people of Invercargill want on council. Because obviously with the first past the post system, um, you're not really telling us who you who you like. So if uh, when you're voting, you say you like these people, but you can't distinguish whether or not, say, none of them are popular, uh, that you'd rather this person over this person if none of these people get in. Yeah. So. <laughs> Councillor Pottinger? No, I'll hold that one. Right. Thank you. <laughs> Any other issues uh, to report? Um, if that's everything on that issue, we'll just uh, talk about um, lowering the voting age. So Youth Council does not have a consensus opinion on whether we should, we think the voting age uh, should be lowered to 16 uh, for local elections. Um, so we're just going to give our independent sort of opinions on what we think as two youths of Invercargill. Um, go first? Oh, I can go first. Uh, as for myself, I am uh, absolutely opposed uh, to the idea uh, that we should lower the voting age to 16. Um, my opinion is primarily predicated on the belief that I do not believe under 18-year-olds uh, under have sufficient uh, responsibility to uphold um, that right voting is, and we so often just say, you know, oh, it's, you know, it's a right to be able to vote and have representation. Well, with that right also uh, comes responsibility in my opinion, um, I think to have responsibility, you need to be look after yourself uh, first and foremost. There are some, you know, there are some people, of course, some exceptions as always, of um, 16 to 17 year olds who are independent and look after themselves. But many still live at home, um, so not only do they look up, not look after themselves, you typically wouldn't have a spouse or any dependents that they also look after. So I don't think that they have the responsibility uh, that is required to elect um, a body that also has responsibility for a large number of people. Um, also, you can make the argument that, you know, typically those under 18 don't have a great deal of experience um, and the, it's questionable whether or not they're able to make uh, an informed such an informed opinion. Some people will, um, just like some over 18 will not be able to make an informed opinion or may not have responsibility, but I just think there's more people at 18 and it also keeps in consistent uh, with our laws regarding uh, the drinking age when, you know, if you were to get a home loan, for example, all things which require you to be 18, because that's the age where typically you'd have more responsibility and be able to 
you know, make that decision um, in a well thought out manner. Uh, Although you can have children and get married. Mm. Not without your parents' permission, though, uh, if you're under. I, I believe, anyway, I think if you're under 18, you need to get um, your parents' permission to get married between 16 and 17. I'm, don't, I'm not 100% sure. But. Mm. Levi, have you got a, an opinion you want to share? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, I'm advocating for lowering the voting age from 18 to 16. Uh, I've sort of prepared a speech, so. <laughs> um, you go for it. Um, so yeah, with a few points to explain why it's necessary and beneficial. Um, I think the argument against lowering the voting age um, is sort of only based on assumptions, like 16 year olds are too immature or will vote at random uh, in these elections. But you simply can't assume that 16 and 17 year olds aren't capable of making educated proper decisions. And yeah, nor can you assume that every voter over 18 is capable of making informed decisions. But you also can't discern what is an immature or random decision uh, unless a voter admits to it. Um, there is also no evidence to say that 16 year olds are less responsible or reliable than other voters. Um, the immaturity points kind of null and void there. Um, and how do we suddenly trust them once they turn 18? The problem everyone has with it is a lack of trust, like a fear of change. Um, and it's not very fair on the underrepresented age group. Working 16 year olds contribute to the city, they help to uphold it through the labour they provide, yet they are not given the chance to participate in deciding which people will make major decisions for the city, for them. Even when decisions like how our public transport is managed, for example, can directly impact their daily life or their ability to work. By disallowing them to have this, you're only encouraging them to have apathy towards voting. If these people are expected to act as responsible members of society, how come we don't let them give their opinion like other contributing citizens? Some countries in Europe have already made this change. Um, as 16 and 17 year olds have the same criminal responsibility as adults, similar to what we have uh, with 17 year olds in this country, uh, and that people of this age are on the verge of full independence. They are planning for their futures. Uh, this change has seen significant positive results in that the 16 to 17 age group had a 90% voter turnout in a national council election in Austria, uh, and that they were engaging with politics. We trust and expect this age group to do many things, to drive safely, to work, to be good citizens, uh, to handle our money at supermarkets, to behave appropriately. Uh, yet even when they are such important contributors, they don't have a way for their say to be truly represented. How is this fair? For no good reason are we not trusting them. There are a few important benefits to allowing this age group to vote. It encourages them to be more politically active uh, and to learn about how everything works from a basic starting point with local government. It provides a reason to look into candidates and to inform themselves on the fast changing political landscape. It makes voting a familiar process uh, and encourages uh, the likelihood that they will vote in future elections. Lowering the voting age will also increase their sense of responsibility and give them a sense of ownership with the city, which may encourage them to find out about more important local issues. Uh, and it will likely dissuade them from things like graffiti since they feel they are valued by the city. Uh, all in all, the decision to lower the voting age is not just about politics, uh, it's about fairness and respect for the voices of our youth. By making this change, we will show that we value all who contribute to our society uh, and that we want everyone's voices to be heard. Thanks. Thanks for sharing your opinions, guys. It's worth noting that you need to share those with members of parliament who ultimately are the ones who make the questions? decisions. Councillor Pottinger. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I guess my question is that I'm sort of open-minded on it, but obviously it, it's, it's a sign of being an adult um, when you are allowed to vote at 18, and with that comes the ability uh, to serve in the military. So obviously would you see that being dropped to 16? And the key one is being tried in court as an adult for, for crimes committed. You, which is slightly different for 16 year olds at the moment. So do you see, if you did drop the voting age, those other things would fall into line, tried as an adult and being able to serve in the military? I do see things like that happening, because it's, it's only fair, right? Um, same with things like uh, 16 year olds being able to run for council. Um, I say, yes, you can. Like, you can leave school at that point if you have the means to, if you have the time and the ability, then why not? Why don't we let them? You'll miss a fair bit of class time. Okay. <laughs> Trish. Leroy, I'm um, involved in education, and you're an absolute credit to come here and present like that. Well done. Thank you. 
Any other questions, councillors? Mayor Clark. Just a couple of things, Chair. Um, uh, Ryan, you did really well to push back on uh, Darren on that. On that issue. <laughs> yeah. Not many people get some ground over him, so that was really good. Um, just one general question. Um, last year, when we had a first past to post election, um, I fronted up with seven other candidates as a mayoral forum with the uh, Invercargill Young Professionals Group, which you would have thought was a, a group slightly older than you guys, um, but have a professional focus. I think there was eight of us there and eight of them. So that, in some ways, gives me a bit of a message that young people are not necessarily into this, this space. They're more interested in sports, uh, life development, getting a house sorted out, relationships, jobs and other things. So just an instant your view on that. Um, yes, I, I would agree with the statement that I, I some people are um, just the same uh, in general elections. There's always the exception, but I think it is fair to say that most people are not that engaged. That's something that you'd want to do more. I wouldn't see that necessarily though happening by lowering the voting age. Yep. Um, yeah, I wouldn't. I don't see participation um, if you, we were to lower the voting age being very yep. significant. And, and your view on the um, disparity between local government and general elections? Um, it's very low. Uh, yeah, youth participation in general elections quite low. That would be even lower yep. um, in local body elections, um, which. The amount of participation I don't think is an argument for why you should or shouldn't um, lower or have changed the voting age, but um, yes, it is something to note. I guess I, guess I, was, I was alluding to the uh, general elections being 18 years, mm. not 16, so it's a little bit like saying you can, you can drive a car mm. down one street, but you can't drive it down another street. Um, it's a little bit like saying you can vote on local elections, mm. but you can't vote on them general election yeah no i think it is important to have consistency yep. uh, across the board and that includes um what was uh mentioned by uh, councillor pollinger with uh the military and um other various things that should remain consistent but not marriage uh, <laughs> yeah. unless you got a note yeah <laughs> permission just, just one one other issue um at your inaugural meeting that you had um, I did suggest, and, I, and I'll, so I'll suggest again, that I'd really like to hear what the Youth Council's view are on climate change going forward. What do you think this council should be doing? Um, it's a really open-ended question. Um, a lot of councils don't know what to do. So given that climate change is more likely to affect your generation than mine, um, it'd be interesting at some stage if you mm. could give some thought to that. Yep, no, I think that would be good to do. Uh, yeah, we'll definitely look at having a discussion into that. Thank you. Councillor Campbell. Uh, I mean, it was great to hear you effectively present it like a debate where, you know, on the one hand and on the other hand, it's exactly how a debate's normally conducted, and that was great. And, of course, it, it comes down to, I think, as a matter of judgment, isn't it? And I think if uh, probably if I asked each of you to argue the reverse case, you probably could do it quite well. So I'd, I'd, I'd just wonder where you'd, you'd reflect what you want to say about that. I, I, I mean, when exercising judgment, do you see that there's actually quite a difficult balance to be struck here? And it may be that it may come down on one side or the other side, and it's not necessarily that, that means, therefore, that the, the arguments that you put are wrong it's just that you know hey look there's a there's a yin and a yang and you end up you try to judge as best you can either you want to comment on that uh, yeah it's a hard thing to argue about um for either side um but yeah ryan and i are both debaters actually <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, if that means anything to it um yeah i think it's important to have the discussion though um even if there are very strong opinions for both sides um Councillor Soper, then Councillor Cracker. Thanks, Mr Chair. Thanks for the well thought out views, both of you. Um, I just wanted to make a comment from my long experience of standing in elections in uh, New Zealand that I don't think the participation rate at traditional public meetings should be taken as any um, 
guide on people's actual interest in the election. In fact, since I first stood um, for Parliament in 1993, the, the drop in attendance at traditional public meetings has been extreme. And it's not just in Invercargill, it's around the country. Um, there are many other ways that people gain their information about elections and debate the topics, but traditional public meetings aren't, aren't a guide to whether or not any particular age group is interested um, in, the, in a particular election. There's heaps of other ways that people now get their information. Mm. Councillor Crackett. Oh, thank you, Councillor Ludlow. Um, just a quick question, really, and you've spoken before, and I think it's been spoken about by quite a few people today, that you know participation in those lower ages or age brackets, and particularly anyone under 40, um, which for local government being young if you're under 40 is a bit of an overstatement, um, but that's what it is, that's what the benchmark is. Not if you're 80. Eh? <laughs> wow. But no, wow. That's what the benchmarks, benchmark is for local government, is that anybody under the age of 40 participation or um, elected is considered young, so unfortunately I fall into that bracket. Um, is there anything that you can see from your standpoint or that Youth Council has given consideration to how to boost that participation? Because I know, like you said, well, Councillor Campbell said that it's clear that you two would be able to e clearly exercise that judgement really well, and the people that sit around Youth Council table with you will probably in that obviously political activism sort of space, or certainly they pay attention. Uh, what else can we be doing to get to boost participation in not just local elections, but in politics in general, or um, any kind of council activity in general? Uh, good question. <laughs> um, in terms of what council can do, I'm not really sure. I think it probably comes down to a, a more societal level. Um, with our culture and how we view um, politics and discussion and various things. Uh, I guess typically, in, in general, we, we think council can probably help out by, um, you know, by doing effective advertising and just trying to do their best to engage people. But then again, that's easier said than done. Uh, yeah, so just working on engagement, but we, it's not, yeah. In a perfect world, it would be like part of our curriculum, I suppose, um, learning about political uh, things, but that's a hard thing to do um, with biases uh, in schools. Um, to raise awareness around the subject, um, I don't know, guest speakers at schools. Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Reverend Cook, then Councillor Pottinger. Um, thank you for actually raising the point that I was going to make because I think one of the reasons why people like me are somewhat cautious about lowering of the voting age is because of the dearth of actual relevant education within schools that equip you well to necessarily um, make quality decisions around election and and I speak as I know because it didn't really happen for us when we were young either and by the time I was 21 I thought I knew and I was sadly deluded um, because I just did not have that education or life experience to evaluate what what was being said and, and heard so I like the others want to applaud you on the way that you have presented the differing opinions that you have on these things and the engagement that you are making through Youth Council because I think it will stand you in good stead going forward. So thank you both. Councillor Pottinger, finally. Thanks, Chair. Look, yeah, just a quick one. Obviously, we've seen the voting age drop over the years and um, say it does get to 16. Do you, do you see in the future some disgruntled 14-year-olds sitting here in front of Council <laughs> saying, hey, you know, we... <laughs> We, 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 Have we you dealt with many 14-year-olds? What? <laughs> Most of them are disgruntled. Okay. Well, once... <laughs> once that's it, not true. Okay. So, you know, where does it stop? I think that's exactly the point, Councillor Pottinger. You know, we make reasons for why it should be 16, but, um, you know, if 16, why not 14? Or why not any... Why not just, you know, from the moment you're born? You know, there's not really... if we, We're not setting it and keeping it consistent with other things like 18 
Now, when you become an adult, I, I think it, you know, there's not much justification why it couldn't be either either, why it couldn't be even less. But I assume Levi has oh. differing to say on that. Why not 14? <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, it depends on how you want to look at it, I guess, because, yes, you can have it in line with everything else, but how necessary really is it? Um, if you wanted to have it in line with something, I'd say have it in line with uh, working age. Um, obviously, we have 16-year-olds more likely to work than 14-year-olds, but it's still an option for them. Um, and I think even provided that, we almost could just give 14-year-olds the chance to vote. <laughs> then. No, that's cool. Sorry, it was a bit of a tough one. Yeah, this could go thanks. on forever. Yeah, yeah. yeah thanks yeah. for that. So, uh, Thanks for indulging. Pania <laughs> and Leslie, can you keep them brief, Pania? I just want to acknowledge and thank you both. You make great politicians. <laughs> <laughs> hope that you can move in, in that direction. Leslie, I just wanted to say, don't be a, don't be afraid of infinite regression. It's the arguments that count. Yeah. If the arguments are equally as good for looking in years to come at the voting age being oh. lowered to fourteen, then then councillors of the future will listen to those at the time. It's the arguments, not the principle of infinite regression that's the issue here. Before we receive the report, Ryan, you had a question you wanted to pose. Yes, I just had a question regarding uh, council and councillors' use of TikTok. Um, this question is uh, sort of just in light of uh, recently, a month or two ago, parliamentary services um, banned the use of MPs uh, use or, or downloading of TikTok uh, on their devices and devices that have uh, contact uh, with sensitive information. My question is, uh, has Council thought about um, this, uh, this themselves? Or I'm not sure how many of you have TikTok, but... Um, have you had a look around the table, Ron? Right? <laughs> <laughs> probably not, but all you need to do is, yeah. There's um, probably two of us, and yeah. one of us doesn't dance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. So. Um, the council itself doesn't have a policy at this point, and we we haven't raised it. Um, Mayor Clark, you didn't have any proposal to no, no bring forward the banning of of TikTok. Well, why not ban everything? <laughs> yeah, anything to do with technology. <coughs> ah, yes, that was like the last column. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, I guess it, it's our position is it's individual choice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, uh, Council has a TikTok account. I was just going to ask because I thought I saw that. Yes. On the other hand, I wonder how, if we used it on our devices, whether we would get trapped by a new technology that is just supposed to protect us against spam and all those sorts of phishing and all those sorts of very things. Probably. Yes. Yes. Probably. Yeah. Two completely separate. To, to, to be fair, we're not that interesting. <laughs> Tom. No, I, I was just going to observe that the blank stares that you get um, equally from me, you know, if, if you'd ask a question about how we feel about Latin declension, you'd have got every bit as blank a stare. I mean, I think TikTok for me is a foreign country. And it's, it's actually, you know, guys at your age that are, and ladies at your age that are, should be making those kind of calls because I don't know anything about TikTok. It's an ironic description, Tom. Alex. Um, I just wanted to, I, I guess, assure our youth council members that I, I, I say it's extremely unlikely that um, any of our members around this table had TikTok installed on council devices, and that's what the parliamentary guidance was, was that the, it was a blanket ban for TikTok to be on any parliamentary issued device. Um, and so for us, the only device that we have is our iPads. Some choose to use our personal devices. Um, and I could safely say that they probably don't have it on their iPads. <laughs> um, also, that just the assurance of that we do have um, some cybersecurity practices in place. Um, all, of our, um, our, all of our sensitive information, I suppose you'd say, um, is received through protected cloud platforms. So. And fair to say, actually, that none of the social media platforms or any other apps are readily downloadable. Not that I've tried yet on my council device, because my other devices have plenty. Yes. From my youthful perspective, I think we're safe. <laughs> thanks for asking the question, though. We appreciate it. Yeah. And, and thanks, guys, for an invigorating presentation. Um, <laughs> I think it all goes well for a, a good year with you, council. Thank you for putting yourselves forward. 
and participating, and thanks very much for coming along this afternoon. Councillor Crackett? I was just youthfuling in brackets. I thought you were going to move. Oh, yes, I am. That we receive the report. And I'll second that. Thanks. Put that all in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Okay. Ryan Levi, thank you for coming along. Thanks. Very good. Thank you, Councillor Ludlow and Council Anne, your worship. Councillors, that takes us back to the beginning of the agenda. We've got the minutes of the Wellbeing Committee uh, held back on March 14 that they'll be confirmed. Move moved those. Councillor Pottinger, seconded Councillor Crackett. Any matters arising? If not, put the motion all in favour. Aye. 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 Against? Carried. And minutes of the District Licensing Committee meetings uh, held. Move that they received. Seconded. Second it. Councillor Soper, put that. All in favour? Uh, aye. aye. Against? Carried. No questions. Oh, may I ask yes. one? I'm just fascinated. What is the Hutter meeting? Under Hutter. The Healthy Sorry. Attitudes Towards Alcohol. Thank it's a, um, <laughs> a multi-agency group that looks at what can be done in a coordinated approach to minimise alcohol risk locally. Thank you. It's just an acronym I hadn't seen before. I'm pleased that I could answer it. Uh, that brings us along to the um, programming framework. Richard, come and take a seat. Kia ora uh, Be assured I'm not going to go through all 47 pages of this, but I will just give a, an overview to start with. We're really aware that Council does some pretty amazing things uh, across our plethora of community services. Often they are done with an um, eye-wateringly focus on community to do the right thing. But we're also aware that sometimes we don't always leverage our power and our critical mass across Council. And more coordination would mean a greater efficiency and a greater impact of our programs. And that's the birth of Rangaranga, the art of weaving. So taking the expertise, the centre of excellence from all over Council and ensuring that they are meeting together and, and building and leveraging off one another. A couple of points I'll make. Um, the programming framework is around uh, having a bit of science behind our decisions and a bit of purposeful intervention in the community. It is not uh, a replacement of curation. So each of our sites will have specialist curation that they do, whether it be an art gallery, a museum or a theatre, etc., or a library. That specialist curation stays intact, but it's where we operate on the fringes, where we can see a program happening in one site might have greater impact if it's coordinated with a program at another site. Obviously, you might say, well, surely you're doing this already, and we are doing an element of this, but this just puts an extra safety net to ensure that um, we're always using to our Māori lens on things, a community development lens, an active rec lens, and a cultural lens on everything that we do. Uh, I will take the report as read if you, and welcome any questions at the Chair's discretion. Thanks, Richard. I, I guess it's a, an opportunity for a more coordinated approach, and Councillor Crackett will recall that with some of the events committee funding, the questions that we asked people were what other forms of engagement. So you're looking at taking a proactive approach and, and talking at a, at a higher staff level at the activities going on to make sure that we can get the most out of what's happening in our spaces. Absolutely. And look, this is starting at a officer level, at a <coughs> council organisation level, but it should set the the uh, work practice, if you like, or approach to start to go wider into the community. We're really keen to do genuine partnerships with community groups, and this is a way of structuring ourselves to actually grow into the commercial and community uh, organisations that exist in, in, in Invercargill to really do some powerful stuff. We're using a similar approach uh, for the City Centre Promotions Group, which is coordinating um, promotions across the different players in the commercial world. And it's um, it's working really well. So this is just a way of working that we want to build on and solidify and give you confidence that when we make a decision, it's not just something that we've invented out of thin air, that we've done some serious thinking about ratepayer spend and ratepayer impact. Thanks. Councillor Pottinger. Uh, thanks, Chair. Look, looking under the heading of financial implications, it says there are no added costs. Now, I, I sort of, it's sort of like you, you sit back when you see that in a, something that's new added and it's a program. 
So, like, even looking at Appendix One, the report, so that was not done by a consultant. Was that done in in house or right? Mm. Yeah, I, I see it was untitled and un, unnamed. Mm. So, there is no, there is no extra software. There's no extra, you know, paper documentation. Nothing. Uh, there is extra paper documentation through Mr. Chair, it, but that is simply to clarify our thinking so as we're not stepping over. Sometimes uh, we acknowledge that we've been doing multiple programs across the city at the same time and each spending on a bit of advertising, each spending on a bit of expertise that we could have actually come together and been more efficient. So no, this isn't, the, and the programming team is a virtual team. It is just about bringing people together and working okay, together. Okay, so that takes to the next question, who the coordination, obviously, is it done by, by a person overseeing it or is it a whole lot of well-oiled cogs just miraculously working? Uh, through you, Mr Chair. The, the second uh, idea of the well-oiled miraculous cogs, would, it would be an aspirational thought. Uh, we already get together and we do do this at a certain scale. So, for example, the most common um, way of working is, for example, school holiday programs and all the representatives in our community and our um, uh, leisure and rec group get together already and do that. So this is just about coordination and meetings. It's not uh, added extra. It's making sure that what we're doing, we're doing it well. No, I guess yeah. my, my question was there must be to coordinate. You often need a chair or someone, someone to drive. Yeah, so uh, we have had commitment from parts of council to step up to that sort of stuff. But remember, we're all part of it. This is about a leisure and rec response at this point in time, and therefore we are already meeting regularly and, and working together cooperatively in a one council approach. Reverend okay. Cook, then Councillor Dermody. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, kia ora, Richard. I guess the classic example would be Tawiki o Te Reo Māori, that could be across everything that the council does, all of our business, not just leisure and rec. So that's uh, an all-in all approach. Um, but the one thing that I did notice an absence of was the mention of Tahinaki, the Civic Council building itself, because whilst you do promotional activities for the Civic Theatre within here, um, this would actually be a place where we could be doing other um, promotion of Hiwakatui or promotion of something at the library or those sorts of things. So I just noticed its absence um, and thought I'd draw it to your attention that I thought that this building could usefully be part of that process, even though it's not part of Leisure and Rec. To respond to that through you, Mr Chair, you're absolutely right. Um, I've tried to stick to my mandate and stay within my, for once, stay within my department. Um, but <laughs> if proof of concept works and this is something that council sees value for and sees the result, uh, obviously we'd love to see it expand throughout the rest of council and then, as I say, into that, those community partnerships as well. Heaven forbid I should lead you astray, Richard. <laughs> Councillor Dermody, then Councillor Soper. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just um, page two, you've identified some areas and you note there may be more deployment across the wide area. Just wondered about the Bluff community and also South City, were there any sort of areas or places there that were given consideration that may be on the initial phase? Through Mr Chair, again, um, we've just kept this tight to Leisure and Rec and we actually don't have a huge presence in Bluff. We do have the library uh, obviously out there. Uh, and a community partnership with the pool, etc. Uh, again, we were just trying to make sure that we're not uh, going too big, too quick, yeah. uh, but certainly we want to yeah. take consideration. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Councillor Soper, then Councillor Cracker. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll just say, and the Maritime Museum, which Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Yeah. Um, but that, well, that wasn't my main point, but I just wanted to say um, anything that is going to be more collaborative is great. And coming coming from a background in this particular area, I can see the the um, wins in this. I was initially a little bit worried that there might be some watering down of curatorial issues, but having read all forty seven pages, <laughs> I can clearly see that that is far away from being the intention, and I'm I'm comfortable. With that, and I, I think it will be a good collaboration because I think we've all noticed that there has been some times um, when some programs have overlapped in ways that 
probably didn't need to happen or that there were a couple of programs running at the same time where a bit more collaboration would have made a big difference to turnout and delivery. So no, um, good to see it at this point. Look forward to the reports. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, Councillor Ludlow. Um, my question is around the priority gaps and who determines them. And you've got in the paragraph there that there's data that will likely identify obvious areas for programming intervention, but if I look at things like, you know, Splash Palace or the library, we collect nominal amounts of demographic mm. data, like it's either an adult or a child, mm. but we have no way of knowing if they're male, female, if they're disabled, if they're not, you know, like, so how is it, is it all going to be anecdotal from the the managers of the facility. I just would really like to see it being a bit more data driven mm. if it's all in the project framework in that manner. Through you, Mr Chair, absolutely. We acknowledged early on that that's one of our biggest gaps is data, hard, hard, fast data. The criteria in terms of how we've split it up is based on the census um, uh, parameters that they have, so as at least we can see what uh, what the census provides us. But yeah, in terms of surveying our stuff, we, we've got an ongoing conversation about how we actually get that intel, and that's why when we came to the, um, the prioritisation matrix and those yeah. different things, One, I've two, tried three. to mix uh, what is hard and fast absolute science and what is that anecdotal thing? Because we are a human-based business and there will always be an element of, I think there's something missing. Yeah. I think uh, going forward, something we've had a lot of conversation about is we measure the people who engage with council. Mm -hmm. One thing we don't do very well, because it's very difficult, is measuring those who are disengaged or unengaged. Mm -hmm. Who don't we know is out there not using our service? And that is, you know, there have been conversations around perhaps uh, doing intercept surveys at places like a supermarket or somewhere where that has a high population um, but isn't necessarily a user and asking, you know, are you using the service? What are you doing? And that would form some of those priority uh, and uh, priorities. Also, our community engagement uh, processes or even from this council, there's uh, enough information and, and touch points to actually build a, a good picture. But it's not science, and I need to sort of stress that there is no mathematical way to really pinpoint it will always have an element of human interpretation and that's why i've stressed through the document it's not a hard and fast rule and we're not we you know we we want to do this so we can trial so we can error so we can pilot and that means sometimes we'll get it wrong or inaccurate but this will at least mean that prior to making those decisions we've gone through a process councillor boyle um, thank you very much. It's great to see this is the way we should be going. That's excellent. Further um, from um, what's been said, I would like you, if you do are able to collect data, to consider what what part of the city or Bluff or wherever the, um, the people are using it. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a perception that there are some people south in South and Chicago who don't use these events. That they're only used by people who who have it easy access and it would be really useful for us as you can to consider that as well thank you any further questions councillors councillor campbell i i, I must say that <coughs> i mean it's it's good stuff it, it seemed to me an extremely complicated document to try to read and for anybody who's you know, starting from scratch and, and reading it voluntarily rather than compulsorily as I was, you know, I wonder how far they would get. And, I, and I, I wonder if it could be simplified, actually. I mean, it seems to me to be a relatively straightforward system. It's a good system, yeah. relatively straightforward. The challenge would be, I think, to turn it into two or three pages, uh, you know. Through you, Mr Chair, I do have a confession to make at this point. Uh, and that was when I was writing this document and compiling the data, it was meant to be an internal document. Um, as we were going through, we realised that yes, this will help staff who are quite familiar with programming and it won't, it's not quite so daunting, but we realised that there was value in sharing it with elected members because often we do this stuff invisible and we thought, <coughs> um, but I take your point, it's not an easy read. Anybody care to move the two recommendations? I will second. Councillor Dermody, <laughs> Reverend Cook, thank you. Put that all in favour. Aye. Aye. Against? 
Carried. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. And I just wanted to point out I have coordinated my shoes and my tie to the cover report, and I think this is an expectation <laughs> that should go on for all officers. But, <laughs> but, but did you consult with your workmates? Oh, we had a whole programming team at great Excellent. expense. That's, that's <laughs> an extra cost for the program to buy the tie? Or? That's all detailed it's on uniform. page 48. Thank you very much. Good work. Councillors, uh, item eight on the agenda is the Queen's Park land reclassification, but staff have requested that the paper is not reviewed today and is deferred until a later date, so I'm happy to let that happen um, when it becomes relevant. It doesn't need to be enacted yet. So that moves us on to the activities report. Yes. Who's kicking that off? I'll kick it off whilst Excellent. Jonathan and Joe might wander up to the front table so that they can talk to their part of it. Um, look, just a couple of points in regards to leisure and recreation. It does follow it to a degree on to what Richard was talking about around our recovery, around our programming and services. A lot of the data that you've got in this activity report again reflects our, our post-COVID recovery as, as a service area. Um, and a lot of that in part is just because the country is recovering, but it's also because of the hard work of a lot of people around making programs that better fit the needs of our community and getting more out into our community on a more regular basis. So I just think that should be commended and, and recognised that this is not just an accident, that we are working really hard. Again, the cafe results at the Splash Palace do speak to the, the amount of effort we're putting in to make sure we're providing the right service at the right time. and. Um, again, because we are succeeding, people are buying more, and that's great for our business. I'd also probably want to note, uh, just in regards, you have picked up around uh, Queen's Park and the potential for future tree removal. Now, this is in line with our requirements um, to support the air traffic in the air park, um, and we have worked with the airport in prioritising where these trees are and unfortunately we've got individual trees but because of the way our trees work and winds that we will be looking at a program of tree removal that takes out um, groups of trees uh, because we have to also provide a really healthy and safe environment for our users on a daily basis. We'll be doing as much as we can to minimise that and we'll communicate uh, the program once we have got it through within the next couple of months as to where this will happen and, and when. Um, and certainly want to make sure that everyone in the community uh, is rest assured that whatever we remove, we will be replanting very quickly. And, and you will have seen that along Calvin Street and how we have um, removed a stand of trees and replaced it almost immediately with um, more trees. Um, they will take some time to grow, but if you've ever seen a historic photo of Queen's Park, it did not always have big trees. And so we'll be uh, looking forward to that program. Um, I'm happy to pass over to Joe and Jonathan to have a quick summary, then we can take questions then. So our numbers are pretty consistent from last year to this year, heading through our um, Civic Administration Building and also Bluff. Um, the only other point that I wanted to add is that the education around the parking kiosks, that's going out in our rates notices this month, and also the library staff have been trained and they're going to support us in any education that's required for the community around that. Um, so I'll, I'll take my parts of the report as read. Uh, probably the only significant update is just regarding the parking, which we discussed at the last wellbeing committee meeting. Um, to speak to Joe's point, uh, a lot of it seem, does seem to be around education, but also we've identified that uh, there's a potential for um, reviewing the activity as a whole within the activity management plans for how we actually approach parking compliance with what we're trying to achieve. So. Thank you. Questions, councillors? Councillor Campbell. I wonder if you could comment a little bit more about the flight path issue. When you remove trees, particularly a lot of trees, as you know, it, it will result in comment, which is mm. not all very um, good. Um, when an aeroplane passes over the trees in Queen's Park, it's about a thousand feet, just by mm. judgment. We don't have many trees at a thousand feet high. I would think the highest would be 50 feet or something. So, uh, I mean, it, it, it sort of sounds like it's a 
excuse rather than a reason. Um, I mean, if I was explaining to somebody why it is we've got to take out that standard trees, um, if I said, well, it's because of the flight path, I think they would say to me, well, you know, that sounds like an excuse rather than a reason. So I just wondered if you could explain a little bit more how the height of your tree in that location affects an aeroplane a thousand feet up. Well, I, I guess touching on that, page 67 gives a summary from our district plan requirements of what sets out the minimum requirements. And the Civil Aviation Authority set the regulations in regards to flight paths for each of the airports around the country. And so what we are really doing is working towards more of a compliance with uh, our own district plan and with the CAA requirements for that flight path. And being a pilot, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, however, our trees are into that air zone. And so uh, the airport have requested that we remove those 43 odd trees. Uh, and we'll be prioritising that over the next two years based on, um, I guess, in terms of height, uh, but also based on location and how we best achieve that and also maintain the amenity value of the park too because we do recognise it as a, a very fine balancing act. So the, the key point, what you just said, and I'm sorry if it's in the report and I've just never quite picked up on it, mm. we're removing these trees at the request, specific request of the airport. Mm. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Councillor Boyle. I'd just like to acknowledge the um, work that you've done with the parking metres, and I'm just going to give you an example. I was with Joe giving out um, gifts on Friday, and there was a woman um, in our area who was having trouble with a parking metre. Joe was outstanding. She explained um, to her about the app, how it worked, and whatever else, even gave her um, her number to contact her if she needed more. So if that's the kind of service that you're doing, it's excellent. Thank you for the feedback. Any other questions? Reverend Cook. Oh, I had a comment as well, and it's very similar to Trisha's. Um, I came into the building one day and somebody was struggling outside um, as a non-user of parking meters for an obvious reason. Um, I asked one of the concierge staff to help and they were very prompt and very, you know, and I appreciate that they do go beyond the extra mile for um, the people who use the facilities around here. I think it's important. I wish I actually knew how to do it myself, but not having the need, it's just something I don't need to learn, I don't think. Thank you. I'll give them feedback. Hey, Clark. Um, just a totally separate issue for Steve. Um, I get a lot of questions from people about the eye centre that used to be in the old museum that doesn't seem to be anywhere now. Um, people from outside the city that come in. I mean, recently had a look at the one in Wellington, which is quite a large space, probably as big as this chamber. Um, three or four staff, heaps of people in there wanting that physical contact. And I know we've had the debate about you can do it all online, but it seems to me there's still a, a good level of people that are uh, older, I guess, not familiar with tech, uh, or um, people that are um, foreigners that might be tourists here that feel more comfortable with actually going and fronting up to somebody and getting some pamphlets about it. So uh, I didn't have the answer for people to keep asking me, you know, what's our I saw it as a franchise and, so, and not a cheap one. Yep. And there are other options that we could look at to provide that similar service for those who prefer the brochures and the one-on-one -on -one personal contact. But iSight itself, I think once the museum closed, we had a temporary one in, in Wachner Place. Yep. Um, then tourism stopped. Uh, so there was no point in continuing to pay to be part of a franchise. And the franchise, from memory, Steve, struggles to um, make a profit in most venues apart from heavy tourist centres. I probably couldn't make a statement definitively on that point, but I think each location varies based on where you place them, what role they are, and um, certainly, as, you know, as part of our looking at what the future museum looks like, we are reaching out to our friends in the Department of Conservation um, who also have the information centres as part of their service and we're working with them on what that might look like in Invercargill. So I'd be happy to bring back further advice to this meeting um, once we've had that conversation with them. Yeah, I think with the tourism, 
doors being open now, um, and it would be helpful to know whether we're going down that track of yep. providing Thanks. it. The last one was very well received. Every time I was in there, there were heaps of people in there looking at mm. tourism options, and with certainly with Jeff Thompson and the ILT also wanting to get into this area, it might be quite helpful to give some thought to that, I guess. Joan? Um, the Bluff Service Centre and also Concierge downstairs, we do get requests for information and we are, you know, um, always on the internet, etc., and helping people with the information that they need. So we are able to supply some of it as people yeah. come in, and particularly Bluff, they're very busy in that space. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So no further questions. Would somebody like to move the reports received? Yeah. Councillor Boyle and Campbell put that all in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. That brings us to the end of the public session. Uh, I'll now move that we go into committee for the reasons as outlined on the agenda, but uh, if we can allow uh, Ricky Parata and Jana Davis uh, from Tatapu Otani to remain for an item that comes up first in public excluded public forum. So I'll move in that direction. If there's a second, uh, Councillor Dermody, thank you. Put that all in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? Aye. Carried. Uh, the live stream for this will end and we...